All right. Okay. So again, I say apologies in advance for the uh, the technical difficulties with the Zoom. I hope. So is it the only reception down in that corner? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I hope that whoever's on the Zoom can hear me properly. All right, let's begin. Let's begin. It's 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 really it's it's incredible, absolutely incredible. Okay, let's get started. So tonight's question in life's biggest questions. Uh, and tonight's no exception. Tonight is a big question. Uh, something that we, uh, an activity that we engage in quite often, uh, relatively speaking, when you consider the fact that it's uh, something that people don't necessarily look forward to and uh, something that uh, one would not necessarily volunteer uh, to do uh, is uh, fasting. Fasting is something that we as a, uh, we as a people engage in uh, relatively often, we engage in fasting um, uh, four times a year in commemoration of the destruction of the temple, um, uh, an additional two times of the year. Um, uh, one is, of course, Yom Kippur. Uh, the other is Thomas Esther, as a uh, remembrance to the fact that all of Israel fasted in order to try and turn over the decree of Haman. Uh, and uh, then there's also some customs related to fasting that we engage in. For example, uh, someone on their wedding day fasts. Um, uh, a chas and anakala both fast on their wedding day. Um, we have customs related to fasting. For example, uh, someone who has a nightmare. The Gemara talks about someone that takes on a tanis halom, someone that takes on a fast because they are very, very, very shaken up by their dream. In fact, the Mishnah Bura has very, very specific details regarding examples of a type of dream a person would fast after having, for example, someone dreams, I think it says in Mishnah Bureau, you dream three nights in a row, um, a vivid dream of a safer Torah burning. That would be a, uh, that would be a, re that, that would be an example of some, something someone would want to, uh, uh, want to fast, uh, want to fast over. Uh, the firstborns fast on Erev Pesach, unless they go to a Siam and they hear a Siam. Uh, there are those that have the custom of Fasting throughout the month of Elul, uh, a more common practice is to fast during uh, Aseres Yemei Teshuva, the 10 days of repentance. Uh, probably most common of that time period is fasting on uh, Erev Rosh Hashanah, but those are just cu customary fasts. There are the obligatory fasts, though, that we fast um, uh, during the year, as we mentioned. Um, and uh, most notably, we fast in commemoration of the destruction of the temple. As the Rambam points out, in the fifth chapter of the laws of fasting, he says, Yesham Yamim Shakoyisom Misanim Behem, that there are days that the entire Jewish people fast during if they had Behem due to the calamities and the tragedies that occurred on the anniversary of those days. For example, and he goes through the different examples. The four types of fasts are um, uh, are the Som of, uh, of, of Shlishi Betishrei, the third of Tishrei. That is when Gedaliah ben Achitam, the mayor of Jerusalem, the governor of Jerusalem, uh, there was still one pocket of uh, a ghetto, basically a Jewish ghetto in Jerusalem after the, uh, the second temple period. And uh, Gedaliah ben Achitam was uh, killed. He was the governor. So he was the last glimmer of hope for that period. And then when he was assassinated, so that's it. He lost all glimmer of hope of that, uh, from, from that period. So we fast on that day, the day he was killed. Um, and, we also fast on, says the Ramam Asiri Betevis, the 10th of Tevis, which is um, a, a, uh, it was a week from yesterday. So it's going to be the 10th of Tevis. Today is the, uh, the 4th of Tevis. So it's going to be uh, next, uh, next week, Tuesday, the 10th of Tevis. Why do we fast on that day, says the Ramam? Because Shabbo Samach Melech Babel, Nebuchadnezzar, Harash, Al Yushalayim, because uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, during the first temple period, surrounded Jerusalem. That was the beginning of the end points out the Chassam Sofer. It was really then that was the impetus for the entire destruction of uh, Jerusalem in that first, uh, in that first exile, uh, which is why the Chassam Sofer rationalizes a really interesting opinion of the Abu Draham, the Abu Draham, Rabbeinu David Abu Draham, 
who died in 1363 in Toledo, Spain, uh, best friends with the son of the Rush, um, uh, um, the tour, Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher. Um, and uh, he has a beautiful commentary on the Siddur, and in his commentary on the Siddur, he writes that if Asar Bateves were to fall out on Shabbos, we would push aside Shabbos and we would pass Asar Bateves. The only fast day that's like that. We don't even push, push aside Tishba for Shabbos. We would push aside Tishba. We push off Tishba to the next day. We don't push aside Shabbos. The only fast day that we would fast on Shabbos is Yom Kippur. And no other fast day would fast on Shabbos except, says the Abu Yiraham, Asar Bateves, the 10th of Teves. Why the 10th of Teves? So the Psalm Sofer, even though it practically never happens because of the way that the calendar is set up, it's impossible for it to happen that the 10th of Teves would fall out on the Shabbos. But if Theoretically, were to ever happen, we would fast. Why? The Chassam Sofer explains, he said, because the beginning of the, uh, of the calamity is where it's most hurtful. When you see the, the when, you, when it's the beginning of the end, when you see the destruction about to happen, so that is when it's most, that's when it's most painful. That's what the Chassam Sofer suggests. And that pain is something we can't shake and that we would even fast on, uh, we would even fast on shots. So anyway, that's a very, very interesting uh, um, uh, Abu Draham. So that's the 10th of Teves. Then there's Shiva Asar Tammuz, the 17th of Tammuz, where there were five different uh, calamities that happened on that day. That's the anniversary of the, uh, when uh, uh, Moses broke the uh, first set of Luchos. Um, uh, it is, um, uh, there are many of it's the day that the, um, um, uh, that the, uh, um, uh, uh, temple was uh, um, uh, uh, besieged. It is it, the anniversary of five different terrible calamities that happened on that day. Tisha B'Av, Tisha B'av of course, we know is the um, uh, most, uh, most difficult day on the Jewish calendar. Five different things happened on that day. Both Bate and Mikdash were destroyed on that day. Um, uh, a horrible, horrible day on the Jewish calendar. So those are the four fast days we have in commemoration of the destruction of the temple. But the Rambam explains why is it in general that we fast? Why is fasting the approach of what are we trying to accomplish with our fasting? So the Rambam says the whole purpose of a fast day is in order to awaken hearts, in order to, to awaken our hearts, to get us focused. So it's to wake us up, to put us on the path of teshuva. Very similar language, not exactly the same, but very similar language to why it is that we build the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, the Rambam says, that it's in order to or yeshen and mishenaschem, to wake up those that are sleeping, in order to do teshuva. So this also, the purpose of a fast day is to wake us up, to focus ourselves in order to do teshuva. In order so that it could be a commemoration, a reminder of our actions, haraim, our evil actions, umaisa avotenu, and the actions of our forefathers, Shahaya Kamaha Senu Atha, which are exactly like our actions today, meaning we have not learned from their mistakes. Our ancestors made a mistake, which led to the destruction of the temples. And we have yet to learn from the mistakes of our ancestors. And we continue to engage in the same activity. Until these calamities and tragedies happen to them and happening to us. Why? It's not happening to us. The Beis Amidish is not being destroyed every day. No. It says the Yerushalmi in Masef Azuma right in the beginning that yes, it is. Any, any time the Beis Amidish, any generation does not experience the Beis Amidish being rebuilt. Ki'ilu hefrivo. It's as if they destroyed it. Why? Because there's one way to bring the Beis Amidish back. Fix the mistake. You're still doing the mistake. That's why the Beis Amidish is not here. So by definition, it's like we keep destroying the Beis Amidish. So therefore, the Ramam says, well, the whole purpose of fasting is Teshuvah. Whole purpose of fasting is teshuva. The question that uh, we have to ask on the Rambam is um, that where did the Rambam get this from? That the whole purpose of a fast day is teshuva. Where did he get that from? I mean, one of the major critiques of the Rambam's work, by the way, of the Mishnah Torah, is the fact that he doesn't cite himself on anything. He tells you, trust me, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. But we have a hard time just taking people's word for things. And a person should be able to defend themselves and back themselves up. Now, I'm sure the Rambam very well could, but he doesn't. He does not cite any of his sources. He doesn't, he just tells you, he tells it like it is. And then you have to take his word for it. So that's why there was so much um, uh, uh, backlash to the Rambam's work, the Mishnah Torah, because 
He did not cite himself on, on anything. That's why you have works that come along trying to defend the Rambam, but before then there were many works attacking the Rambam. So where did the Rambam get this from? That the whole purpose of, of, of a fast day is teshuva. Teshuva we know we do during Elul. We do during the 10 days of repentance of teshuva. Um, uh, it is a Yom Kippur theme. I wouldn't unnecessarily assume that it is a Tisha B'Av theme or a Shazar Batamus Batama thing or this Tuesday when we're going to be commemorating Asar Bateves. That is an Asar Bateves theme. Why is it the theme of fast days over the destruction of the temple? It is, what does Teshuvah have anything to do with that? The, uh, not only that, but uh, this is actually cited in the Magan Avram. The Shulchan Aruch brings down the halachos of the requirement to fast. He says, Chayavim lehis amish for Tishvav. One needs to fast on Tishvav and, and the 17th of Thomas and the 3rd of Tishrei and Asar B'teves. Because of the terrible calamities that happened on those days, the Magan of Ram writes, quoting straight from the Ramam, the reason for this is today la'or halavavos tshuva, in order to awaken us to do teshuva. That's why we fast. The Mishnah Bura even adds on, and he says, the all of these days, the entire Jewish people fast during these days, because of the calamities that happen on those days, again, using the same language of the Rambam, in order to awaken the hearts to do Teshuvah, to get on the pathway of Teshuvah. According to the Rambam, this is supposed to help us remember all of our terrible deeds, and the, our ancestors' terrible deeds, which are just like ours, until these calamities happen to us, and through remembering all these things, it will bring us to do teshuva. Therefore, the Ramam uh, says the Mishnah Bura, says the Holy Chavitzah, every single person is supposed to put onto their heart on, during a fast day, but Osanayamim, will and to do introspection on how it is that I act in order to do teshuva, the whole purpose of a fast day is just to do exactly that. It's funny, right? When you're a kid, um, uh, you, uh, you think um, uh, when you're, when, and, and when it's a fast day. So um, I remember when I was a kid. So um, the next day, people would, uh, um, would show off to one another what it is that they were able to do on a fast day, even though they were fasting. So this one played basketball for six hours a day. Um, another one went on a hike. Another one ended up um, fasting an extra three hours. Uh, you, uh, you missed the whole boat, right? You play basketball the whole day. You think like you're some strong man that you're able to fast while playing basketball. You missed the whole boat of the fast day. The whole boat of the fast day is, as the Mishnah Bura ends off, he says, Tip shu, he says that anyone that engages like this, that people that are fasting, they go on these hikes and they go on these trips and they just try and spend the day away and get their mind off of the fact that they're not eating. They held on to the um, um, to the less important part of the fast, the fact that they were actually not eating, and they left behind the most important part of the fast, say, which is doing tishu. So, again, it's very clear in the Rambam and in the and the Magen Avram and the Mishnah Pura what it is that I'm supposed to be doing on a fast day, but that's not what I would have assumed a fast day is about. It's what I would assume Elul is about. It's what I would have assumed Yom Kippur is about. I wouldn't have necessarily assumed that a fast day over the destruction of the temple is all about Teshuvah. What would have I assumed it is about? Simply speaking, I would have assumed it's mourning. Mourning over Jerusalem. It's an act of mourning. It's, in fact, there are Many connections that are obviously many connections that are made between the Avelos, the, um, uh, the mourning that we do over the destruction of the temple versus the mourning that one does over the loss of a parent um, or one of their seven close relatives. That th there are a lot of similarities between the two. In fact, Rabbi Soloveitchik points out very good imagery to help one understand the process of mourning we do over the temple versus the mourning that we do um, uh, uh, over uh, the loss of a loved one. For the loss of a loved one, it is what the Gemara Nivamos refers to as 
a belus chadasha, new a new morning. It's fresh. It's raw. Versus the morning of the destruction of the temple, which is what the Gemara refers to as a belus yeshana, a a historic morning. What's the difference? You have to come at it from Rabbi Salvechik said two different angles, and you go at it from two different angles, you get to the same goal. What are the two different angles you come at it from? When it comes to new raw mourning over the loss of a loved one, so the beginning is the most difficult, right? When the person first passes away, so you stop all other activity. You don't make any blessings. You don't do any mitzvah. Your whole focus is doing your only mitzvah, which is to bury the individual. Once that's over, so then and you, you've torn your kriya, you tear your clothing, you then go and begin the three days of crying, the shloshes you made Bethel, three days of crying. From the three days of crying, you move into Shiva, the rest of that week. You're sitting on a floor, you're not greeting people, you're, you're, you are, you're not learning Torah, you're an immense mourning period. Then you move a little bit further away from, from the tragedy. So then you get up from the floor for the next 30 days, you don't cut your hair, you don't shave, and then you move into the rest of the year, a year of mourning. But as time goes on, it is, it's gradually less intense of a mourning period. When it comes to the destruction of Jerusalem, mourning the destruction of Jerusalem, it's exactly the opposite. When um, uh, you come to the three weeks, which are the three weeks between the 17th of Thomas and the destruction of the temple on Tishabov. So you start out that three-week period by taking on some customs of mourning, some customs of mourning. You don't shave. It's more similar to the 12 months of the year. Then you come to the nine days or the Shavuot Shalhaba, the week of Tishvav itself. Then there's more intense mourning, certain restrictions on food. And, and then you get to Tishvav itself and you're sitting on the floor and that's like Shiva. As you have to build up to it because it's not fresh in your mind, you need to build up to it. But it's a mirror image of the, 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 same, of the same activity. So I would have assumed then that the Rambam should have said, what is the whole purpose of us fasting on these days? Because it's a, it's a form of mourning. This is part of the mourning activity. It's what we do. This question is asked by the Chassam Sofer Rabbi Moshe Sofer, uh, also Rabbi Moshe Schreiber, um, uh, the 18th century major Hungarian posek. Yes, he does not understand why it is the Rambam pins fasting over the destruction of the temple um, on Teshuva when it should just be pinned on mourning itself, mourning in and of itself. He writes as follows. He says, The Rambam brought something up here that no one would have ever thought of. There would have been no direct connection between Teshuva and fasting over the destruction of the temple had the Rambam not mentioned. That we would have thought that these fast days, has really nothing to do with Teshuva, Rather, it's, it's more similar to like what we would consider like a yurt site, where you, you once again take on one more day of mourning because it's, it's an anniversary of a terrible tragedy, right? So you would fast, you um, uh, um, uh, sort of learn about the, 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 the destruction of, of the temple. It, why would we consider this to be a moment of teshuva? It's, it's, it's Avelis, no different than any other Avelis. The same way that we celebrate a joyous day on Purim, because it's the anniversary of a Simcha, of a, of, of a day of tremendous joy. Hanukkah is the anniversary of tremendous, of, of tremendous joy, and therefore we are joyous over Hanukkah. They, so therefore, this should just be Avelis. So this is the question from the, uh, this is the question from the Psalm so. So the Chassam Sofer, just point out, is not off base. There are primary sources that indicate as such. I'll give you an example. One example is um, the Gemara and Megillah on Dafe. The Gemara and Megillah is discussing what happens when Tishva falls out on Shabbos. And the Gemara says, if Tishva falls out on Shabbos, you push off Tishva till Sunday. 
Why? Because the Gemara says um, uh, that we do not bring calamity closer to us. Akdumi um, uh, uh, we do not bring calamity closer to us. We want to push it away from us. So we push off the fast day because that uh, is not something we want to bring upon ourselves <laughs> sooner. Essentially saying that we want to push off the Avelis. We don't want to bring the Avelis sooner, closer to us. That's why we'll push off Tishvav to Sunday instead of fasting on Shabbos. Um, the Ritva, the Ritva was a student of the Rashva, um, uh, also a Spanish, uh, Spanish Rishon. The Ritva also writes, the whole purpose of a fast day is Avelis. He writes, for, he writes the following. He says, the Ritva writes that he ta- he's talking about the following scenario. He mentioned that a Hassan, um, uh, um, um, that a Hassan during his Shiva uh, made Mishta, during his seven days of, uh, of joy, uh, theoretically speaking, you would think shouldn't fast. Why? Because it's a joyous period for him, right? It would make sense that he should, him and his wife, they probably shouldn't fast during their Shavu Brachos. But what if their Shavu Brachos um, uh, coincided with one of the fastings? Coincided with uh, Asara Pateve. Someone got married, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's say someone gets married tomorrow, and then during their Shavu Brachos is going to be Asara Pateve. Do they fast or not? So that's an interesting question. The Ritva says, Yes, they do. Why do they fast? Says the says the Ritva, the Kamakum Kivan the Regal Shalo, Regal Yachid, since their celebration is an individual one, Vitanios Elo Durabin, and the fast days are for the whole public, meaning it applies to the entire Jewish people, versus his Yantiv only applies to himself. Asi Avelus the Rabin, the Avelus, the morning of the public using that keyword, Avelos, morning of the public, is going to push off It's going to push off the yantiv of the individual. So it's going to trump the, the, the individual simcha is the communal calamity, the communal mourning, says the Ritva. So again, we have a Gemara that indicates the fact that fasting is a sign of mourning, which is why we push it off till the next day if it falls out on Shabbos. Number two is we have precedent in other Rishonim also, even though the Ritva lived about 200 years after the Ramam. Nevertheless, we have someone of a similar rabbinic stature also pointing out that the whole purpose of Fat Days is a form of mourning. It's a form of of, of, of Avelis. Um, so where did the Ramam get, the, uh, get this whole teshuva, uh, teshuva thing from? So there's a very, very interesting uh, response that is given by Rabbi Yerucham Olshin. Rabbi Yerucham Olshin is the uh, Rosh Yeshiva, one of the Rosh Yeshiva of the Lakewood Yeshiva. Uh, the Lakewood Yeshiva was founded by Rav Aaron Cutler uh, in uh, the 1930s. It was founded in Lakewood, New Jersey, which then and still now is basically a farm town, except now it's a very, very different farm town. Then it was just basically cows. There was just cows and hens. And that, that was all that there was in Lakewood, New Jersey. Um, uh, in fact, when he went to go establish the yeshiva, or Byron, they, uh, his friends in Slabat, the yeshiva, were saying to him, saying, what are you going to go do, st- start a, uh, a yeshiva in, in Lakewood? How many bachram do you think you're going to come and, and study in, in your yeshiva? And, and uh, Rabarin Cutler said, uh, said, said, I think that there's going to be at least 50 and after 100. Maybe there's even going to be 100 students learning my yeshiva. Today, sitting in the Lake of Yeshiva are close to 10,000 students sitting and studying Torah. There are more than 100,000 religious Jews that live in Lakewood Township. It's, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. So the current Rosh Yeshiva, one of the Rosh Yeshiva, is Rav Yerucham Olshin. He's a major Talmud Chacham. So he... Um, um, his students started collecting a lot of a lot of his um, uh, um, lecture notes and uh, started publishing them. So in his lecture notes related to uh, um, uh, related to fast days, so he has a, a fascinating answer to the question over here that we have on the Rambam from the Psalm Sofer, which is where did the Rambam get this? Where is the precedent for the fact that these fast days are supposed to be days of um, uh, days of uh, teshuva? you would assume more logically is that they are days of mourning. 
The answer, says Rabbi Ruch Moshe, is that in the Rambam's view, mourning and teshuva are one and the same. The whole purpose of mourning in the philosophy of the Rambam is supposed to accomplish teshuva. The Rambam himself writes in the 13th chapter of the laws of mourning. He's discussing a scenario of someone who does not take the uh, dictums and the direction of the rabbis seriously when it comes to mourning. We know that really all mourning is rabbinic in nature. We have precedent for uh, mourning in the Torah. We have precedent for, the, for mourning from uh, Parshas Vayeshev in the, way that, uh, in the way that Yaakov Avinu sat Shiva for Yosef HaTzadik. We have it from Avram Avinu in the way that he did for Sarah. We have in the Torah precedent for mourning. We have the way that um, all of Kla Yisrael mourned for Miriam and Aharon. Uh, we have the way that Aaron did for his uh, sons. So there is precedent for the concept of mourning in the Torah. In the halachos in the Torah as well, there's, there's precedent for mourning. That when we bring, um, uh, when we bring Miser to the base Hamigdash, so part of the Vidui Miser, part of the declaration that you give to the Kohen, um, you say um, uh, um, that you did not eat from this, uh, from any of the Kodesh over here, many of the Miser Shane, you did not eat from it in your state of, uh, uh, during a Yom Mar, during a state of intense mourning, referencing the day that a relative passes away. There, so there is definitely precedent for mourning in the Torah, but all the details and the way we practice mourning is rabbinic law, all found in the third chapter of Mesech the Moit So the, uh, the Rambam brings down all of the details of mourning and all of the laws of mourning in Hilfus Avelos, Hilfus Avel. In the 13th chapter, at the end, he discusses someone that chooses to ignore the, um, the rabbi's um, uh, um, prescription for how one is supposed to observe mourning over the loss of a loved one. And he writes, Call me abel, that anyone that chooses not to mourn, in the way that the rabbis had, um, uh, had given the, the, the direction and how to mourn, they are a callous individual. They are a person that is uncaring. Essentially, achzari, using probably the most accurate but harsh translation, a heartless individual. You're a heartless individual if you do not mourn according to the way that the rabbis told us to mourn. Ella, rather, what is one supposed to do when they follow all of the laws of mourning from the rabbis? Ella, yifachet, a person should have a sense of fear and reverence. V'yidaik, you should be worried during that time period. That's not what I'm talking about. V'yifashfesh b'masa, you should be doing introspection. The yachzor b'teshuva. And you should do teshuva during your days of mourning. The echa b'mnei chabur shemes tida'i kol chabur kula. And then the Ram continues to talk about that if, let's say, one person from a group of people passed away, so that whole group of people should go through this process. But the Rambam's main point here is that the entire outline of, from the rabbis of how to do mourning all of it was coming from the philosophy, coming from the perspective of how could we help a person when they are in their mourning period do teshuva. So here's what we're going to tell them to do. We're going to tell them to change their shoes. We're going to tell them to sit on the floor. We're going to tell them to cover the mirrors. We're going to tell them that they're not going to shave. We're going to tell them that they're not going to greet people. We're going to, we're going to tell them not to learn Torah. All of these things are designed to help a person do teshuva. What's the Rambam talking about? What's interesting, before we explain the Rambam, what's interesting is that from a purely, um, for using purely anecdotal evidence, that's all I have on it, from my personal experience in, um, in counseling people that are going through mourning um, or um, helping people in their Shiva period or almost everybody has a similar experience to what the Rambam described. That when a person is going through a mourning period, when they're suffering the loss of a loved one, they're reeling from that loss, there's a tremendous amount of introspection that happens. A person ends up growing a tremendous amount 
from that whole experience. It, it, it's, it's part of what happens. There's no doubt about it. It's part of what happens is that a person grows from that experience. And hopefully if they take the experience seriously, which I think most people do, if they take it seriously, like the Ramam saying, so they end up coming out of it a better person. They're thinking about what this person meant to them in their lives. They're thinking about how I could better my actions in light of this loss, how I can continue on this individual's legacy. It, it ends up having a radical effect on people for the positive. The, the tragedy itself is extremely difficult, obviously. And that could set a person back in other ways, but in, ter in terms of self-growth, if a person takes the mourning process seriously and they follow the directions of the rabbis, they end up coming out of it a, a, a better version of themselves, maybe a sadder version of themselves, but a better version of themselves. The, the Rambam is essentially saying, when you read his, his words carefully, that this was actually what the rabbis had in mind when they were creating every single one of these halakhas. But more than that, he's saying that if a person chooses to ignore these directives, meaning they're not using the opportunity the rabbis has set out for them for self-actualization using the tragedy, capitalizing on the tragedy that they just experienced. So then they're a heartless person, why? Because they don't care enough about the person that they just lost to use it as an opportunity to better themselves. So essentially, what was their life? What was their, what was your relationship for? if not for it ultimately to affect you for the better. If it's not to ultimately affect you for the better, so then you were completely in the relationship for self-serving purposes. A person engages in a relationship because they know that there's something lacking in themselves that this other person can help them with. And therefore it has an effect on them. You take, uh, th that's, that's why a person would take a relationship seriously. The Ramam essentially saying then that through the mooring period, it is supposed to be a form of teshuva. The base Hillel, the base Hillel, not the one in the Mishnah, the base Hillel is a commentary on Shulchan Ar. Um, uh, he has a commentary on the laws of Apeus, the laws of mourning, and he has a very interesting explanation based on the Rambam as to why it is, as to why it is that that a, um, uh, as to why it is that um, someone below the age of bar or bat mitzvah does not, um, does not engage in avelis. Now, we have a halacha when it comes to someone who is a child. So children do not mourn. Um, they have the right to, of course they could, if they want to sit on a low chair, they are welcome to, if they um, want to, um, uh, um, you know, if they choose to not greet people, they choose to not shower, whatever they choose, they, of course, have the right to, but um, uh, it, we don't require children, the same way we don't require children uh, to, do, uh, to do any mitzvah. Um, a person's not, you know, bar about mitzvah age, so then they are not technically obligated to do any mitzvah. Um, uh, there is one exception when it comes to mourning, and that is carrying kriya. Uh, rendering garments, we do even on children, but that is not for the child. Rather, it's actually for everybody else because when they have that image in their head of uh, a child wearing torn clothing, um, everyone realizes that this is a serious tragedy and that more people um, are there for the family in that scenario. So it encourages everyone to um, galvanize around the family when they see, when they see that image. The, but even though, technically speaking, children are not obligated to do mitzvot in general, but there is a concept called kino of education, where we start having our children practice doing mitzvot, so that way, when they become of age to do mitzvot, they're already ready to do so, so, and we put tzitzis on them, and we, uh, we bring them to shul, and uh, we give them a lul of an esrog, and they eat matzah at the seder, why? Because they are engaging in the concept of chinuch, preparing themselves for when they're actually going to be obligated in these things. But Avelis, there's no chinuch. We do not have the obligation, nor do we encourage the child to um, uh, engage in the activities at all. If they want to, as we mentioned, sure they can. 
but the parents, let's say one of the parents is still alive um, uh, um, and the child is in mourning period, there is no obligation for that parent to, in, to educate their child. There would be no obligation for the child's Rebbe to educate their child in the mourning process. They would not um, sit on the floor. They would be able to go out and play with their friends if they so desire. Why is there no chinuch when it comes to avails? Why is that the exception to the rule? There's chinuch, we educate through experiential education when it comes to every other mitzvah, but not avails. Why not avails? So the base Hillel says, based on this Rama, we can understand perfectly. Because what's the whole purpose of avails? What's the whole purpose of avails? Teshuva. A child. What does a child have to do teshuva for? Has the child done any avails? Has the child done any wrongdoings? Could be that they smacked their brother in the face and they stole an extra cookie from the cookie jar. And it could be that they called out in class and it could be that they, yes, all of that could very well be true. However, from an accounting perspective in God's mind, have they done anything that they would be accountable for? No, not at all, because they are below the age of bar and bat mitzvah. So therefore, what kind of chinuch are you going to be giving them? What would be the purpose of doing this exper experiential education over something that actually they wouldn't even be doing? If the whole purpose of the activities of mourning are to do teshuva, then what are they doing teshuva for? There's nothing for them to do teshuva about. And therefore, there would be no chinuch. There would be no experiential education for children when it comes to mourning. If the whole point of mourning is to do teshuva. The Beis Hello writes exactly that. He says, There is no obligation of Chinuch when it comes to Avelis. Even if they are just a few days shy of being Bar Mitzvah, because the Rambam writes that that a person who does not follow the, 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 the dictums of the rabbis when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to mourning, is heartless. The whole purpose is the absorbent tshuva, to do teshuva, you do introspection, do tshuva, that's the whole purpose of Avelis. Therefore, says the Beis Hillel, Nimsa she'ikr hatama Avelis, the whole purpose of Avelis is mishum teshuva, is for repentance, is for making up for your mistakes that you've done, to start fresh, to start anew, that from this tragedy, I'm going to be a different person. And when it comes to a child, when it comes to a kid, in Shaykh Kamzesh, he asks for tshuva. There's nothing for them to do tshuva about because they, they, they're not yet accountable for any avarice that we did. The haloku lav bar onshin. There's no punishment. There's no accountability when it comes to their actions in God's mind. Because this child is still being taken care of from other people, they are not yet obligated to do mitzvah. They are not liable yet in any negative commandments that they may have violated. Therefore, there would be no purpose of them in um, engaging in the Avelis process because its whole purpose is to do teshuva because when reeling from that loss, a person goes through that introspection and then comes out the other side, having decided I am going to be better than I was before this happened to me. Based on all this, says Rabbi Ruch Molshin, now we can understand the Rambam when it comes to why it is that we fast. The Rambam says the whole reason that we fast is in order to do the teshuva, the whole purpose. Why we fast? To awaken the hearts, to stir the hearts in order to do teshuva. I thought these fast days are acts of mourning. Yes, they are acts of mourning. But the whole purpose of mourning over the temple is to come is to become better after that whole process. It's amazing to me, absolutely amazing to me, that you see on Tish above itself, on Tish above itself, people, Tish above night, everybody's sitting on the floor, it's dark. Then the next morning, people are sitting on the floor, it's keenness, whatever. And then Tish above Mincha, people are already getting up from the floor, they're starting to talk to one another. We put on to fill in, we start Mincha. And during Mincha, people are already talking about that the kinos we said were too long, the rabbi's Joshua was unnecessary, the mamish on Tish above itself, people are already starting to engage in sinas chitim, the whole deal. 
on Tisha B'Av itself. I, but I fasted the whole Tisha B'Av. I fasted the whole Tisha B'Av, right? That, no, the, the Mishnah Bura says you missed the whole boat. You took the less important thing and you threw away the more important thing. The more important thing is Teshuvah. It, the the Nitziv, the Nitziv, ah, the holy Nitziv. And I say, as I mentioned before, and I, I, I stand by it, the Nitziv was the most influential Jew to live in the last 200 years. Without question in my mind, the most influential Jew to live in the last 200 years. The Nitziv, maybe the last five, maybe, maybe since the Shulchan Aruch, the Nitziv, the Rosh Hashiva of the Vlash and Yeshiva, he passed away one year after the Vlash and Yeshiva's tragic closing. He passed away in 1893. The Nitziv writes in, in his introduction for um, his book, Ha'amek Davar, uh, which is his commentary on the Chumash, which was taken from his, um, uh, from his Chumash here. The Nitziv used to give a daily uh, Chumash class that was then recorded in, uh, in students' notes that uh, were published in the Ha'amek Dover. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable work. The mind of the Nitziv, he writes like a Rishon, sort of a Shefter says, the Nitziv writes like a Rishon. He, 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 he writes uh, um, uh, like, he, like, like he's living in a, in, a, in a different era. So the Nitziv writes in that whole introduction, he writes the following, he says, that the whole reason why we are still anticipating Mashiach's arrival, is because of the sinas chinam, the uh, disdain that we have towards one another, shibaliba zeh et zeh, that shibaliba zeh et zeh, because in every single person's heart, chashtu et mi shiroi shirau shinoi shalokedatam, that we look at other people and we say that they're not acting the way that we act. As if to say the way my grandmother. Um, uh, she should live and be well. The way that she says it is that we uh, people make a mistake and that they expect people to act the way that they, or, the, the, or they expect people to act the way that they that they think that they should. Right? You expect we we all expect people to act the way that we, do, right? So we look around and we see that people are acting not the way that we do, and therefore they don't act the way that we do when it comes to Yeres Hashem, when it comes to the way that we. Um, have our relationships with God, the way that we practice religion, the way that we practice Judaism, we look at other people, and Shehut Tzeduki Vapikoros, and just because of the way, just because of the fact that they don't practice Judaism the way that we do, because of the fact that they think that Mincha is supposed to be 40, uh, is, is supposed to be 14 minutes, and Mincha is really 16 minutes, so then that person is a Tzeduki Vapikoros. They are an apostate, they are a heretic, and Vibo and through this, it leads to bloodshed. And this leads to all of the calamities, all of the tragedies of the world until the destruction of the temple and the fact that we still don't have a base on Megdash. So if there's one lesson to come from all of the fast days, whether it be Tish B'Av, of course, even the minor fast days, Shvasar Batamos, Tzom Gedalia, Asar Bateves, that the whole purpose of a fast day, yes, we fast. But why do we fast? We fast because that is supposed to be a reminder for us, a constant reminder throughout the day that every time that we see a cup of water and say, that looks fantastic, I could really go for a cup of water. Or we see a, uh, we, we smell what's being prepared for dinner that we're going to have later that night after the fast day and we remind them, oh, I'm so hungry. What we should be reminding ourselves is, hold on, that should be reminding me that I need to come out of this with a better sense of avas chinam, better of ava for my fellow Jew. The phrase avas chinam actually never comes up. We have the phrase sinas chinam, a baseless hatred. You never, you'll never find the phrase ahavas chinam, baseless, baseless love. Why? Because there's always, a, there's always a reason to love another Jew. There's always a reason to love another Jew. Sinas chinam that happens all the time. People are, are not tolerant enough with one another. We're not respectful enough to one another, as the, as, as the Nitzv just pointed out. But Ava, you'll never find the phrase Ava Sinam come up anywhere. I like to say that uh, I think it'd be a good idea if we changed the, the party line. The party line is that, um, that, that 
we um, uh, we need to work on our Abbas Israel. We need to work on our love of the Jewish people. We need to work on our sinaskinam of our baseless hatred towards one another. I think we should change it to, I need to work on my sinaskinam. I need to work on my Abbas Israel. I need to work on my love for my fellow Jews. We put the blame on other people. We, it, it, even just saying it, we need to work on, is already saying that I'm not the problem. The other person's the problem. We, everyone else has got an issue. No, let's just start with me. I need to work on my Abbas Israel. I need to work on my Sinas Kina. And I think through doing that, so hopefully as the Navi Zachary says, that some Rabi'i, some Hamishi, some Shvi'i, but some Asiri, that the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth month. The fast of the seventh uh, of, of the tenth month is the one that we are about to engage in. That's Asar Bateves. It's the tenth month since Nisan is Teve, the fast of the uh, tenth month. the base Yehuda should be for the house of Judea. With Sasson, Ulasimcha, Ulamod should be day of joyous, of, 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 of simcha, of joy, of celebration with the rebuilding of Jerusalem that this day of Asar Batevis, this year, God willing, on Tuesday, should be a day of simcha shviyantiv in Yerushalayim, God willing.